Right, um, so we've heard from Brian about the potential, uh, well, the science of climate change and then the, the potential impacts of climate change. What I'm going to do today is talk a bit about the impacts of climate change on the UK economy and some work that we've done for DEFRA recently, looking at what the indirect impacts of climate change are on UK business, and then describe some of the work that we're seeing being done in the business community on how they can build resilience to climate change uh, and how they're responding to, the, to that climate challenge. But before, before I do that, I, I want to get your views on, on where you think we're going uh, in terms of uh, the development pathway that we're on. And um, what this chart does is sort of set out in simple terms um, the current emissions pathway or the development pathway that, uh, that countries are on. And you've got emissions per capita on the vertical axis um, and then GDP per capita on the horizontal. And if you divide the world into four quadrants, you know, you've got the, uh, the industrialized economies in the top right, you know, with high emissions per capita and high GDP per capita. You've got the industrializing economies like China and Korea on the top left, whose, uh, whose GDP per capita is rapidly rising. Uh, and then you've got the developing economies on the bottom left, um, like, like Ethiopia and India. Now, of course, what we're, what we're hoping for, or what we're aiming for, is for all these economies to shift towards a low-carbon pathway. Um, and we describe this as a sort of, you know, do we need a, a, a green deal, a new green deal, to achieve this low-carbon uh, economy? So this is... This is one possible trajectory that we may go down. And what this would do is that would avoid breaching the dotted red line there, which uh, sort of represents uh, the total emissions that we can, uh, we can emit to atmosphere uh, to avoid global warming. An alternative pathway is that we keep on uh, going as business as usual um, and that climate impacts start to have uh, a significant impact on, uh, on our economies, and it actually sets our economies back in terms of GDP per capita. So the climate impacts are so severe that, uh, that it, it really impacts on, on people's wealth. And I've called this the, the sort of catastrophic climate scenario. And then the, the fourth scenario is... Um, is rapid response, and this is really where something provokes, some impact of climate change provokes um, a, a rapid response from governments and society more broadly, and that, and that forces or allows us um, to, to move down towards uh, the low carbon, uh, you know, to, to be in a, in a sort of a, a low carbon economy. So I, I want to just sort of start off by getting your views on which pathway uh, is is most realistic. And so I wonder, you know, who, who amongst you thinks that we're going to just continue on the business as usual pathway and we're going to breach that, uh, the dotted red line and in fact probably climate change won't be that relevant um, and that we'll just continue on that business as usual pathway. Do, are there any hands there? Okay. There's, there's what, a couple of shows of hands. Okay, so Brian's got a little bit of work to do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> What about the, um, the, second path, the second pathway, the, uh, the new Green Deal? Who thinks that we can shift our economies onto the low carbon pathway rapidly enough? We've got a few more hands. And so what sort of technologies, quite a lot of, quite a lot of shows of hands, what sort of technologies do you think um, would allow that? Do you want to give a view? Who wants to give a view? What sort of, you know, are they, are they current technologies? Are they, uh, are they technologies that we still need to develop? Yes. 
Yeah. And what, what about the, the third scenario? Uh, do people think that climate impacts will start to have a significant negative impact on, on wealth and that's going to push us backwards? And what sorts of impacts might those be? Where, how might those impacts manifest themselves in particular? Sorry, the lights go out. Yeah. I mean, all, all, these, all these issues are the sorts of things that business, the business community is, is starting to deal with. And, and then the final one, the rapid response, is that uh, who votes for the rapid response scenario? No, okay, so there's, there's, there aren't that many optimists then here in the room, despite the fact that uh, you're, all, you're all involved in, you're all part of the solution um, to this issue. So what I'll do just quickly then is describe um, the work that we did uh, in our low carbon economy index. And what, we've, what we're doing is really measuring how rapid the progress is that economies are making towards the low carbon, you know, down this low carbon pathway. And without giving the game away, it's, it's not very rapid. Um, we're basically measuring uh, energy-related energy emissions uh, for the G20 economy, so we take energy data from BP, we look at GDP data from uh, the World Bank annually, and we, it's basically dividing one by the other. Uh, the, the dotted grey line there shows that uh, if we can decarbonise, if we'd started decarbonising our economies in 2000, um, we'd need to decarbonise at about 3.7% per year. Um, in order to limit our emissions and keep our emissions to within a two degrees carbon budget. So the, the line, the dotted grey line shows, the area under that basically reflects a two degrees carbon budget and it shows how, how rapidly we need to reduce our emissions uh, in order to stay within that. Now, the progress that we've made to date has been, uh, is, is shown in the dark red line at the top and basically, you know, carbon intensity has improved. Emissions per unit of D GDP have gone down over the last uh, 12 years or so, uh, but only at about 0.8% per year. This is uh, globally. Uh, and so, so what that means is that, we, that the, the, the rate of reduction that's now required gets much more rapid in order to stay within that budget. Uh, and as the line, as the top line extends further across, you know, the rate of change becomes much more rapid, or the required rate of change becomes much more rapid in order to stay within that, uh, that two degrees carbon budget. And so what's required now is a 5.1% is a reduction in carbon intensity every single year uh, from now to 2050, and in fact beyond that to 2100. Uh, in order to stay within the two degrees carbon budget. And, you know, th this has never been achieved since, uh, since the sort of economic records and energy records began in, in the 1950s. And so we had, we had a challenge of, well, how do you characterize this? This is a long-term trend. Can we be definitive in saying, well, w it's too late now for, for two degrees or, uh, is, is it still possible? Now, to put the 5.1 degrees in perspective, in the UK in the 1990s with the dash to gas, the UK economy decarbonised by about 3% per year. In Germany, following reunification and restructuring, the German economy decarbonised by about 3% per year as well. And in France, when they switched to nuclear in the 80s, um, they, they achieved a 4% per year reduction in carbon intensity. So it's getting close to what we need uh, to stay within the two degrees carbon budget. But we need those, we would need those revolutions every year, every decade. Um, and, you know, the revolution seen in the UK and the switch to gas was only in one sector. We need equivalent revolutions in every sector, in domestic buildings, in transport, um, and in industry. And so what we, what we concluded is the government's targets, uh, the government target of two degrees, and, and this is a UN target as well to limit global warming to two degrees, uh, 
we concluded it was highly unrealistic and that it's time to plan for a warming world. So the next couple of studies that I'll um, describe to you are some of the analysis that we've done on uh, what those impacts might be. And we did a, we, we're doing some work for DEFRA at the moment looking at uh, how the impacts of climate change abroad will affect the UK. And there's been quite a lot of work on how on the direct impacts of climate change on, on the UK, on the sort of increase in flooding or temperature change. Um, but this was looking at how, we'd, how climate change abroad might affect UK business. And so what we did was we, we first looked at where do we have an interest abroad? Um, and, you know, we looked at the level of trade uh, with other countries. We looked at the concentration of that trade. Uh, where are our troops deployed? Where do we make the most foreign direct investment? Where do we provide the most humanitarian assistance? Where are our you know, British diaspora? Um, so we, we, we assessed where are the priority countries in terms of our, of our links. We then looked at the impacts of climate change on those countries. We assessed the, the vulnerability of those countries. So how adaptable are they to climate change? And then finally, we we did some in-depth analysis of um, particular commodities, um, you know, such as food or damage to infrastructure. So this, this map shows uh, a couple of things. The first, it, you know, it shows uh, the countries highlighted in sort of the darker reds shows where we have the strongest links uh, in terms of trade and diaspora and, and other things. Um, and this shows what, it also shows what the impacts of climate change could be, uh, and we focused on agriculture and water availability and, and extreme weather events. Um, now, the work that we did for DEFRA, uh, because the government has the view that two degrees is the core scenario, we looked at, you know, these are the potential impacts of two degrees of change. And there are some positive impacts at two degrees and there, are, and there are many negative impacts. I think that Brian would probably say that, you know, above two degrees and as you approach four degrees, most of the impacts become, uh, become severely negative. So, so when I first reviewed the work that was, was being done by our team, um, you know, my first reaction is, well, you know, why are we looking at two degrees? We've, we've already said it's too late for two degrees. We should, we should look at what the impacts are um, at higher degrees of warming than that. And, you know, this is the government view. You know, two degrees is still a central scenario. So, so finally, um, we assessed the adaptive capacity of, uh, of these countries. So I'll just go back to that. Um, we looked at the adaptive capacity of those, uh, of those countries and the way we did that was we, we looked at things like the Human Development Index, um, governance, uh, and other factors. And, and more or less what we concluded was slightly sort of simplistic, but it was basically the wealthier a country is, um, the more adaptable it is. So it slightly follows Peter Lilly's view that, you know, let's just get rich quick and then we'll adapt uh, in 50 years' time. It's obviously more complex than that because richer countries have um, more expensive infrastructure that uh, is, you know, and when that gets damaged, it obviously has bigger economic impact and uh, it takes longer to recover from, from those impacts. In poorer countries, the infrastructure may be less well developed, um, but it's often there's, there's less capital invested in it. And so recovering from uh, climate impacts may be, may be more straightforward. So it's, it's not, uh, adaptive capacity isn't, isn't isn't only about isn't only about wealth. So having done that, we then we then focused on um, some particular sectors, and you know we focused on food and, and energy in particular. And what we found was that you know that there is you know the significant risk of disruption to food and energy commodities. Um, now in the UK. Uh, there's the ability to substitute between these commodities. It's, we didn't think that it was likely to, that the disruption in supply chains was likely to really have an impact on availability of food, 
uh, or, uh, or particular commodities in the UK, but it, it can certainly have an impact on price. Um, and we could sort of foresee much greater commodity price volatility uh, as a result of climate impacts in the future um, than we see today. Uh, and that can have a, you know, a, a more significant impact on, on the, the, the poor uh, who, who will you know, have to you know, bear, bear the burden of that in, in their shopping basket or in their energy bills, uh, much more so than others. Uh, and, and the same with things like coal and gas and, uh, and oil. There may be disruption, but the ability to substitute between them means that uh, it'll always, you know, those energy services will be, always be available. They're just not necessarily, um, uh, the prices aren't that stable. So overall, um, in terms of sort of threats and opportunities for the UK, there's obviously uh, one of the big ones is that uh, damage and impacts on uh, British assets abroad uh, or, or assets that are insured by British companies uh, could have a significant negative impact on, on the UK business. Um, we think there'll be a much greater need for overseas aid and humanitarian assistance. Uh, there's likely to be much more volatility in prices. Um, and, and I think that we concluded that the UK, while the UK government is focused on supporting business in adapting to climate within the UK, there's obviously the need to, uh, to look at the impacts of climate change abroad as well and uh, consider how, how that might impact on, uh, on, on business in the UK. So what's, what's the business community doing? How, how's the business community reacting to this? We've worked with a number of companies that are following a very sort of similar methodology to, uh, to the one that I described with, uh, on the DEFRA study, where they're basically looking at their supply chains and they're looking at, well, how vulnerable are those supply chains? How resilient are those supply chains? Um, and what, what impacts will that have on their, on their business? Brian referred to some of these mega trends earlier, you know, and business is already having to deal with them, you know, with the uh, ever increasing demand for products by the emerging middle classes. You know, this is putting huge pressure on, on resources. It's leading to fluctuating uh, commodity prices. Um, and, you know, with the, the embargo of Russian wheat import, wheat exports from Russia being an example of how climate change can result in those uh, commodity price fluctuations. But speculation also had an impact on wheat price in 2008. And, and much of the change in the wheat price in that, in that year was a result of speculation, not just uh, the Russian embargo. And businesses are already quantifying the costs of these climate impacts. So, um, you know, Del Monte described how, you know, flooding in Guatemala impacted uh, on their banana crop and you know they resulted in four million dollars of losses. Uh, Bungie described how you know they suffered a, a 56 million dollar loss from their sugar business due to drought um, and flooding in Thailand shut down about a quarter of the country's textile production. So, so businesses are already dealing with these impacts today. So we, we worked for a major uh, retailer in, in the last year or so to try and assess some of these impacts on, on their operations. Um, and really what we do at PwC is try to quantify those and try to put those in a sort of commercial uh, context. And, and we've basically followed a similar methodology to um, what we did with DEFRA and, and brought a sort of commercial perspective to this. Um, Brian referred to some of the thresholds that we might be approaching on climate. Um, you know, what we found is that some of those thresholds um, might be related to the viability of particular crops in particular locations. So uh, we know of a, uh, a, a chocolate manufacturer whose, whose primary source of cocoa is in Ghana and the viability of cocoa production in Ghana is, is threatened by rising temperature in that region. Um, they have very 
concentrated supply chain and they recognize they need to engage with cocoa producers to ensure that they're more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Similarly, with infrastructure, um, some of those thresholds might be in, in the viability of infra infrastructure above certain levels. So if you have extreme heat events, um, that might cause huge damage to road infrastructure. And I think we've seen that already in the UK where road infrastructure can get degraded quite quickly after you know, a, a few weeks of, um, of extreme, extreme heat. And, and what we see businesses are doing is, um, you know, they're, they're reacting in quite different ways uh, to, to these challenges. Some are focusing on uh, efficiency and maximising their resource efficiency and their energy efficiency. Um, this brings the dividend of, you know, lower costs um, and, and some resilience to the, the threat of, um, of price volatility. Others are looking more at how they can build res uh, resilience to disruptive events, you know, flooding, how they can manage their, they're, they're looking at, um, you know, the vulnerability of particular pinch points in their operations. So uh, a distribution hub, is that vulnerable to uh, extreme weather events or flooding? Um, how resilient is their workforce? Are their workforce able to uh, move around and get to, their, get to their place of work very easily? In, um, during Hurricane Sandy um, last year, about 10,000 PwC staff were unable to get to the office for a period of a couple of weeks um, because of the disruption caused by that event. And, you know, we had to do a huge amount of planning to be able to respond to that. Um, you know, we're able to do a lot of the work remotely, but much of the work we have to do is, is on client sites. And so this had a, an immediate impact on our business. So PwC is doing lots of planning around how, how do we respond to these disruptive events. Others are looking beyond their borders. Uh, they're looking much more, uh, much further down their supply chains to assess their vulnerability uh, uh, along their supply chains. And, and all of them are, are sort of anticipating resource, resource constraints. So I, I want to finish by coming back to our low carbon economy index and, and think about some of the uh, slides that Brian presented as well on, on what the potential impacts might be. And it, it's what, what's fairly clear is that we can anticipate some climate shocks and businesses are, are preparing for those. But there's also the prospect of climate policy shocks as well and a sort of a knee jerk policy response to climate change, where um, there might be the, the sudden imposition of new standards or uh, new costs imposed on businesses which, which threaten the viability of, of those businesses or strand you know, major assets. Currently, the, um, the, the price of uh, an EU carbon allowance is around four euros, 22 cents, and so it, that price has very little impact on how businesses um, go about their daily operations. It, it doesn't have an impact very much on the power price at all. Um, it has been up above 30, and what the IEA has suggested is that it would need to be much closer to $100 uh, per tonne uh, if we're to uh, shift businesses down that low carbon pathway that I talked about. So that sort of knee-jerk um, reaction or a knee-jerk policy uh, reaction to uh, climate change is something that, that is possible if the impacts of climate change force or, or bring about the political will to deal with the situation. And I, and I guess to end on a slightly more upbeat note, um, we are seeing that many businesses are preparing for those impacts um, and many businesses uh, that, that you're dealing with are, are, are re responding in a way that's much more sort of constructive than much of what we're seeing at the UN. Um, and so, you know, I, I, it, it's great to be at an event like this where we're seeing the, the, the you know, the sharing of knowledge around low carbon technologies and low carbon uh, implementation plans um, because this is the direction that many businesses will need to go in in order to be able to respond to 
or build their resilience to climate change. Thanks very much.